Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school, and that is what this podcast is designed to do, to educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jade Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only, to learn, to teach, and to love. Love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to today's show. Today's episode is going to be something that I think the biochemistry nerds and the metabolism nerds are going to love, but hopefully it's going to be very um, instructive and useful for everyone else. And this is going to be specifically on the mitochondria. And this is a very important episode. If you are going to understand metabolism and want to work with metabolism, Really, we want to be talking about the end units of metabolism in every single cell in our body, and that is the mitochondria. And there is an awful lot of new information over the last decade or so on the mitochondria that is incredibly useful for all of us and really sets the frame for a lot of what we are interested in looking good, feeling good, living longer, functioning better, all comes down to the mitochondria. Now, from my perspective, when I look at metabolism, I can look at it from, or I like to look at it from both a top-down view and a bottom-up view. Now, the top-down view you are probably very familiar with, especially given that you follow this podcast and many of you who follow my metabolism work. The top-down view essentially looks at the hypothalamus, an area of the brain, as the command and control center of metabolism. And it essentially looks at this as a sensing and responding apparatus, almost seeing the hypothalamus or brain as like a satellite that can pick up information from the outside world via our senses, things like temperature and light, food availability, stress, et cetera, and also pick up information from the inside world, reactive oxygen species, um, things like um, hormonal inputs, uh, myokines, messenger molecules released from the muscle, cytokines, messenger molecules released from the immune system, adipokines, messaging molecules released from the adipose or fat tissue. In other words, just like there's information being sent to the body and the brain from outside constantly, there's also information being sent from inside the body to the brain constantly. And the hypothalamus basically integrates all this information. It senses all this information from both inside the body and outside the body and then responds by plotting a course back to balance. And this would be essentially the top-down way of looking at metabolism. And when we look at metabolism this way, it's all about gross kind of hormonal interactions, things like insulin and how that responds to uh, carbohydrate and protein intake, things like GLP and GIP and how that responds to mixes of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins cortisol and how that responds to stress in the body. So most of us are familiar with the top-down version of metabolism, which is true, which is useful, which is very important to understand. Very few of us, however, understand the bottom-up aspects of metabolism. And that has to do with the end unit of energy production 
the mitochondria. And so we're going to get into detail about the mitochondria. Now, the mitochondria are little organelles inside each cell that act as the energy centers in the cell. But they do way more than this. Not only do they produce energy from the end products of digestion from carbohydrates and fat primarily, um, and also break down products of proteins, uh, amino acids, but they also very importantly are involved in the manufacture of things like hormones. Now, for those of you who are biochemistry nerds, the old way of looking at this is that the organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum was the area that made proteins and uh, hormones. The rough endoplasmic reticulum was usually associated with the idea of making uh, proteins and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum was usually associated with uh, making of lipid molecules and putting cholesterol together and packaging hormones and things like that. But now what we know is that a lot of these organelles are continuous with each other. In other words, they aren't necessarily connected anatomically, like they're not just one big anatomical globule, but they approximate each other very closely. For example, the mitochondria and its membranes have direct communication through very close proximity to things like the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that are making hormones. And what we now know is the mitochondria are making certain aspects of these hormones, and so is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and both are required to construct these hormones. So not only is mitochondria burning energy, which we'll talk about here in a minute, it is also uh, making uh, hormones. And so when the mitochondria become damaged, from a bottom-up uh, perspective on metabolism, not only will you have energy decrements, which by the way, let's cover that here in just a minute. Let's say the end unit of metabolism, the mitochondria, is inefficient in producing energy and it's producing more reactive oxygen species versus ATP. And the way to think about this, for those of you who aren't biochemists, think about the idea between a hydroelectric plant or a a uh, nuclear power plant versus a coal power plant. A coal power plant is going to be very dirty. If you look at it, it's creating energy, but it's also putting a lot of smoke and carbon into the atmosphere versus a hydroelectric plant is putting a lot of steam into the environment, much more cleaner than the smoke that a coal plant would put off. And a nuclear power plant really is very clean in terms of it's not releasing anything into the atmosphere in a sense. And so when it comes to mitochondria and the mitochondria making its energy, mitochondria can burn very clean and effectively making a lot of ATP and less smoke, what we would say are reactive oxygen species or free radicals. These free radicals, when the mitochondria are producing energy, can be produced in that production very much like smoke could be produced in a coal plant. And then those free radicals or reactive oxygen species can go around and do damage to the infrastructure of the cell. And so if a mitochondria is burning very dirtily, creating a lot of reactive oxygen species, a lot of free radicals or a lot of this smoke, it can do damage to the cell membrane and also produce less energy in the process. Now, what would this do? Well, this would make it less likely for us to make proteins in the cell. And even when we did make proteins, there's a good chance that they could be damaged or be malformed. It would mean that the nucleus would be less likely to do and less stable, less likely to do its translation and transcription of the genetic material, be more likely to be damaged less likely to be repaired. And all of a sudden you start seeing when the mitochondria are burning energy in a dirty fashion, creating a lot of reactive oxygen species versus ATP, the energy that the clean energy that the body needs, you can start seeing a lot of cellular dysfunction. And then of course that works its way up. If there's cellular dysfunction, that probably means there's issues with cellular membranes, cellular proteins, uh, production of hormones, and therefore, then these hormones are not communicating appropriately. The proteins that the cells need to do their jobs are not shaped exactly right. And you start seeing this bottom up dysfunction in metabolism. And then you start seeing this translate into not just the cell dysfunction, but then tissue dysfunction and organ dysfunction. And then this uh, sort of system would be producing negative feedback on the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus would be trying to repair 
and respond to this constant onslaught inside the body. One example of this would be a constant chronic inflammation, which does occur from dysfunctional mitochondria, um, creating all these reactive oxygen species, perhaps doing damage in the cell, releasing lots of inflammatory cytokines, signaling molecules, which then go up and irritate the hypothalamus, which then the hypothalamus begins to try to respond and try to keep up and you start feeling more and more dysfunctional and you get in this negative sort of dog chasing its tail type of situation. So while we oftentimes only focus on the, the top down effects, brain and hormone production, what if the bottom up aspect of metabolism isn't working? And even though the top down hypothalamus is able to respond and send the right signals, but the mitochondria are burning dirty energy, creating dysfunctional hormones and proteins, and therefore the response is still a negative response. And so when you think about metabolism, I like to think of it as this top down response. Are we taking care of that? And this bottom up response, are we taking care of that? And that's the reason we're dealing with mitochondria today. So what exactly are these mitochondria? Because as we get into the science of mitochondria, we're going to understand that a lot of what we need to know about mitochondria comes from understanding the evolution of mitochondria. So what we now understand is that we essentially have two types of cells. And this is for those of you who are beginners to these discussions. We have eukaryotic cells, which have a nucleus and have many different organelles. And they're sort of multifunctional in what they do. They contain mitochondria and things like that. Uh, these would be animal cells, the kind of cells that we have in our body are eukaryotic cells in a sense. And we have prokaryotic cells, which are more single celled organisms like bacteria. They don't necessarily have the same materials and same function as something like a uh, eukaryotic cell does. For example, there are many prokaryotic cells that act a lot like mitochondria, but they are just standalone entities. And what we believe happened is that somewhere along the line in evolution, one of these prokaryotic cells got incorporated by another prokaryotic cell, creating a eukaryotic cell. And in animal cells, what we know very clearly from studying mitochondria is they look very similar, if not exactly like certain bacterial probi probiotic or prokaryotic rather cells. Uh, for example, we know that mitochondria probably are uh, a evolutionary offspring of rickettsia bacteria. In other words, mitochondria are ancient bacteria that we have acting in our cells. Now, this becomes very important to understand how mitochondria function. Because if we look at the way bacteria function, aside from mitochondria, and mitochondria are uh, essentially um, the offspring of these, are out offshoots of these bacteria inside of our cells. So they look and function a lot like bacteria, yet they are an organelle inside animal cells. So to understand them, we want to begin to understand how some of these bacterial cells function and communicate. Well, what's really interesting is that when you look at the way bacteria cells communicate, whenever they're under high stress, they secrete different signaling molecules. In other words, bacteria can talk to each other in a sense, in the same way our cells can talk to each other by sending signals like cytokines, which immune cells use to talk to each other, myokines, which muscles used to talk to the rest of the body, lipokines or dipokines, which fat uses to talk to the body, and then just general hormones. These signaling molecules are also used in bacteria, in these single cell organisms. And when things start to get tough, what happens is bacteria, for example, bacteria in our guts, bacteria out in the environment, when things start to get tough, they can send out signals, signaling molecules, that tell other bacteria how they are faring and they can sort of band together. Famously, one of the things that happens is in certain bacterial populations, they can form biofilms. In other words, a particular bacterial population that's under stress, let's say, can secrete chemicals that cause these bacteria to conglomerate together to start secreting certain protective compounds and they create a colony 
of like bacteria with a secretion of certain compounds that almost act as a force field to protect these bacteria. Not only can bacteria do this with their own species, but they also can do this with other species. In other words, there are signaling molecules that uh, bacteria can use to talk to their own species to help them band together and work together. And there are also signaling molecules that bacteria can use to talk to other species of bacteria. Now, hopefully you see where I'm going with this is because if mitochondria are ancient evolutionary offspring of bacteria, then we might expect mitochondria to be able to secrete compounds and talk to the cell and also pick up signals, compounds from other places like the cell, or perhaps even, and this is what's fascinating is some of the research that I want to get into with you, perhaps even these mitochondria can pick up signaling molecules that are released from bacteria residing in our gut. And this is exactly what looks like is happening. And a lot of this research has been done on C. elegans, which is a essentially a uh, earth dweller, a worm that lives in the soil that is basically translucent and has a very short lifespan and is used by many researchers to study things like this. And what they've been showing in C. elegans is that the bacteria that reside in the gut of C. elegans release certain compounds that then communicate with the mitochondria in the cells of C. elegans and begin to have it push it into certain directions and communicate in certain ways that can have beneficial effects on those mitochondria or not. We're also seeing this in now humans. Uh, one of the compounds that we're seeing is polyphenols from things like pomegranates, for example, and walnuts and other things can be made into certain compounds by gut bacteria. We call these prebiotics. Um, or I'm sorry, postbiotics. A postbiotic is a compound that the bacteria in our gut will generate and create from some of the foods we eat. And then these postbiotics, these compounds that the bacteria generate, not just create, gener they can create certain things. They also can release their own communicating molecules, which then get absorbed through our digestive tracts into our bloodstream, end up in the cells, and then can begin to communicate with mitochondria. And in this case, poly polyphenols from things like pomegranates and walnuts can form co a compound called urolithin A, which then can go into the mitochondria and then cause that mitochondria to become more appropriate, more efficient, and more able to repair, recirculate itself, uh, recycle it, certain aspects of itself, something we call mitophagy. And this is just one example that we are now finding in humans. But what we now are seeing is that mitochondria are, in fact, in direct communication with bacteria in our guts, and that this may be one of the major factors that is determining or causing or contributing to the gigantic and huge impacts that probiotics, bacteria living inside of our gut, the so-called microbiome, are having on cellular metabolism and mitochondrial metabolism. We now know that mitochondria fluctuate back and forth between two states. They too, like the bacteria we were talking about that can form colonies, can join together. In other words, mitochondria inside a cell can fuse together, creating a much larger, more efficient, cleaner, more uh, productive energy system. So imagine you have 10 mitochondria inside a cell and uh, you're going through, the cell is going through a starvation response or getting in less energy than it needs. And it needs to be a little bit more efficient at creating energy. What it can do is join these mitochondria, these 10 mitochondria together in what's called fusion. These mitochondria fuse. And when they fuse and become this much, this 10 mitochondria become this larger single mitochondria, the energy that it produces becomes far more efficient. And we know that this happens in mitochondria as nutrient levels drop inside a cell. 
and energy production inside a cell begins to fall, mitochondria will begin to fuse. We also know that as these mitochondria begin to fuse and become in more fusion state, this is correlated with greater longevity, better energy production, less risk for uh, many diseases, especially neurological diseases, dementia, Alzheimer's, things of this nature. It's time to talk about one of our sponsors of today's episode, AG1 by Athletic Greens. Now, many of you have heard me say this before, but I am not a fan of vegetables, which I know is funny given I've been in the health and fitness industry for so long. I blame my mother and father for this when I was a kid. What they would do was essentially take the broccoli, the Brussels sprouts, the spinach, the collard greens, and just steam them. No salt, no fat, no taste whatsoever, just these bitter greens. And so I developed a distaste for a lot of different vegetables, which has stayed with me into adulthood. One of the things I've done to mitigate that is use a greens powder pretty much ever since greens powders have come out on the market. And I've tried every single one. They started out tasting like swamp water. I found a few that I really like the taste. But recently, one that I have been taking for a very long time, as you all know, I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I found that it was actually spiking my blood sugar because probably the tapioca starch in it, which some people don't respond to tapioca starch with elevated blood sugars, I was. And so it sent me on a mission to find another one. And one of my friends turned me on to AG1 by Athletic Greens. And I've heard about Athletic Greens and AG1 for quite some time. I just never tried it. And now that I have tried it, I have become a huge fan, so much so that I partnered with Athletic Greens and AG1 to sponsor this podcast. Now, let me tell you What happened here? After I saw that my blood sugars were spiking, my friend gave me a couple samples of AG1. I began using those and testing the blood sugar and found there was no spike. The other thing I found is that AG1 is interested in its taste profile. It's very neutral. The one I was taking before was a little sweet. I really loved it. But this one is very neutral, which actually suits me because what I found is I can actually not only take this first thing in the morning in water, and have it taste very neutral, almost like there's nothing there, I can also add it into my protein shakes, which means now I'm getting double the greens than I was getting previously because I add this right into my protein shakes and it does not change the flavor of the shake at all. The other thing I realized once I started looking at the label is that this product is not simply a greens product. It also is a multivitamin, multimineral. It also has fiber, which acts as a prebiotic. It has probiotics in it, and it has functional mushrooms, which act as adaptogens in it. That's four different products essentially in one. And I've been taking mushrooms for some time. I stopped taking them now because now I have this in my greens. I have also taken my multivitamin and make this my multivitamin. So I'm actually saving money and this is going to save you money as well. The product AG1 is also NSF certified. And you may say, Jade, what does that mean? The National Sanitation Foundation is a foundation that essentially does testing on products to make sure there are no harmful substances, no persistent organic pollutants, no heavy metals. Now, this costs money to do. AG1 and Athletic Greens has spent the money on this. They spend money on making sure that the product that you are getting is good quality without contamination in it. You might say, well, Jade, isn't this true of all products? And actually, no, it is not. If you ever follow some of the news in this area through uh, consumer labs and other things that do, uh, you know, testing on these products, You'll see that many of them will have trace levels of things like mercury and cadmium and lead and things like that in them because they're not doing this testing. So this is an extra piece of insurance for us. The other thing I love about this product that I learned as I was doing my research on it is that this is the 52nd tweak or adjustment they have made to this product in their existence. AG1 has been tweaked 52 times. Now you might say, well, Jade, Why would they be doing that? And the reason why is because they continue to improve. We know that science is evolving. We know that it's not just about more nutrients. It's about balanced nutrients. It's about the Goldilocks 
effect of this. And they are constantly learning as we all are and then constantly adjusting their product to taste better, to be more efficient and effective in delivering the nutrients. It acts as an antioxidant. It acts as a multivitamin. It's a prebiotic, a probiotic and an adaptogen all in one. They have mastered this over several iterations of this particular product. And so I am a huge fan right now of AG1 and Athletic Greens. And I'm hoping that you will check this out. It's time for all of us to reclaim our health and arm our immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And AG1 does that with just one scoop in a cup of water every single day. That is all you need. There is now no longer a need for a million different pills and supplements to look after your health. All you need is this particular one. It really clears the stage to simplify your supplement regime. To make it easy for you, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash next level. That's athleticgreens.com slash next level to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Check out AG1. I love it. I know you're going to love it. And I'm so happy that they are on board to sponsor the podcast as well. Thanks so much. Check out AG1, athleticgreens.com slash next level. And let's get back to the show. Now, the opposite can happen as well, that when there is too much energy inside a cell, too much nutrition, too much nutrients going on, too much energy being burned, that the mitochondria can split into a fission reaction. So that one big mitochondria splits into 10 individual mitochondria. And this causes the body to be able to be less efficient in creating energy and to protect against perhaps uh, this uh, increase in energy factors and nutrients. And so when you look at it this way, you would say, okay, so from the bottom up perspective, the modern day person who's eating a standard American diet is probably overloading the mitochondria with lots of carbons. What I mean by that is that when you eat lots of carbohydrates and lots of fats together, you the breakdown product in the cell is acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA then goes into the mitochondria, goes through the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle, and then goes through the electron transport chain. And as these carbons begin bro getting broken down from sugars and fats, what can happen is the cellular buses or taxis that drive the electrons or protons into the inner membrane of the mitochondria. These are compounds like FADH2 and NADH. These are sort of what we call mitochondrial shuttles, they will become maxed out. And as that begins to happen, the mitochondria are running at full capacity. This is very much like having a coal plant, a coal fired, let's say, train or, you know, engine that's running down the track. And normally what you would do is take a uh, shovel full of coal, throw it in every once in a while. But now imagine throwing so much coal into this engine that's going down the track, the train track, and this train engine begins to what? If you continue to throw coal in faster than it can be burned, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to become very inefficient and maybe even snuff out the fire. And eventually that train is going to be just barely chugging along, barely able to do its action and create the energy needed to power that coal fired engine that the train is running off of. The same thing happens with mitochondria. It can move more into fission based, split these mitochondria up, trying to control this. But if you continue to onslaught it with all these carbons from fat and sugar from overeating, what happens is you end up, these mitochondria end up in more of a fission state rather than a fusion state. Now, the truth of the matter is you want the mitochondria to be flexible. We oftentimes talk about flexible metabolism when you listen to me talk about metabolism. You don't want a fast metabolism. You want a flexible metabolism. And so what happens is you want to be able to move into fusion of mitochondria when energy is low. 
and when there's more repair and you need more efficient energy back to fission when there's a ton of energy. And hopefully this is in balance, right? So if you're doing everything right, let's say you're eating 12 hours per day and you're not eating 12 hours per day, right? So 12 hours of the day, you're eating plenty of food and the other 12 hours you're resting. Well, during the 12 hours you're eating a lot, you'll be more in fission-based mitochondrial states. And in the hours where you're not eating a lot, you'll be more in fusion-based mitochondrial states. And once again, even at this cellular level of the mitochondria, these organelles, you start to see this Goldilocks effect coming in. It's almost like Taoism of the cell, isn't it? The yin and yang. You don't want too much fission all the time. You don't want too much fusion all the time. You want an equal equilibrium between fission and fusion. Now, given that we are in overeating, overconsuming, constantly uh, consuming more energy than we burn uh, in this particular culture, we probably are pushing ourselves way more towards fission. And this is what we see when we look at mitochondria of dysfunctional metabolisms. When we see someone with metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, dementia, all of these things, we see that people are more stuck in a fission type of state rather than a fusion type of state. And these fission fusion dynamics are very, very important in the plasticity or, or flexibility of the uh, mitochondria. Now, what we want to have happen is the mitochondria to be able to move into fusion more often, given that we're probably in more of a fission state more often. And this has an awful lot to do with what is going on with the microbiome as well. And this is why certain compounds eating lots of polyphenols from foods being made into my, mitochondrial signaling molecules that can be beneficial might be one of the hidden mechanisms of why we see that fruits and vegetables and polyphenol rich foods and fiber based foods can be so beneficial for metabolic flexibility. This might be one of the actions that is happening with the mitochondria. Now, this is one way to be looking at this. So let's talk about some take homes then with mitochondria. What we want to be thinking about with mitochondria is we want to be thinking about eating enough, but not too much and having equal times with food and without food. So this gives new sort of credibility and a new insight based on things like time restricted feeding, making sure that you're going with food and without food equal periods of time. It also gives credibility to the idea that moderation is an interesting concept here. We don't want to be overeating huge amounts. We don't want to especially be eating overeating huge amounts of sugar, carbs, and fat all at the same time and overwhelming these mitochondria. It also gives credibility to the idea that we want to be looking at controlling the reactive oxygen species, this dirty smoke that is sometimes released from mitochondria when we are driving too many carbons into the mitochondria all at once through overeating, especially combinations of fat and sugar. So what do we begin to do? Well, we look at having meals and eating meals and eating in uh, time periods where we're eating for a certain amount of time during the day and we're not. So this time-restricted feeding at, at its best, 12 hours with food, 12 hours without. Also, smaller meals where we are not binging on things. So if you're going to do something like time-restricted feeding or fasting or an OMAD diet or something like that, you may want to be careful about these big, huge meals done with all this fat and carbohydrate all at the same time. It might be better to have smaller meals. And this might be why I've often seen in my clinical practice that when I'm dealing with someone who is very dysfunctional metabolically, even though fasting them or taking them off food might be sort of the best thing, they can't necessarily tolerate that and because what they'll do is they are so hungry and they're so reactive to food that you take them and try to fast them. They often end up fasting for a little time and then binging. So intermittent fasting for them becomes intermittent fattening. And oftentimes to make this a more gentle transition, what we will do is smaller, more frequent meals. This makes sense from the mitochondrial point of view because we are not overwhelming the mitochondria. 
And now add that to the idea of, okay, we're going to eat for 12 hours and fast for 12 hours. And within that 12 hours, we're going to eat smaller, more frequent meals. This can start to make some sense. Not to mention the fact that if we're dealing with free radicals and reactive oxygen species, and for those of you who are not familiar with free radicals and what they are, just think about a free radical as a, a, a flaming softball or baseball that zips around the cell looking for an electron. And uh, while it's doing that, it's ripping apart tissues. Now, antioxidants are compounds that our body makes and can get through food that act as like, you know, a soaking wet, cold catcher's mitt that catch, catches these uh, free radicals, gives them the electron they're seeking and puts out the fire. And so in addition to time with food and without food, sort of time restricted eating and perhaps smaller meals and not binging, we also want to be thinking about making sure we get in antioxidants. Now, the best way that we can do and get in antioxidants is through the antioxidants made. A lot of people think when they think of antioxidants, they think of food. And that's fine to do that. But we can't eat enough antioxidants from food to deal with all the re free radicals that we produce through daily uh, metabolism. And so we need protein, especially things like uh, methionine rich proteins that make glutathione and things like this that are the most abundant uh, antioxidants in the body that can quench these reactive oxygen species or free radicals. So when you're thinking about antioxidants, think about good quality protein intake along with things like fruits and vegetables, because fruits and vegetables can't do this by themselves. And of course, we now know that some of these polyphenols in fruits and vegetables, specifically urolithin A that we know about from pomegranates and walnuts and other things like this can actually help send signals to the mitochondria to be more healthy, to regulate this fusion fission biodynamic rhythm, this Goldilocks effect, and also help the mitochondria undergo mitophagy. In other words, recycling, uh, mitochondria, taking out damaged, dysfunctional mitochondria, and creating better, cleaner burning mitochondria. This is what we want to be thinking about. So now we have three things that we can do to deal with this bottom-up issue of metabolism. Make sure we eat 12 hours, fast 12 hours. Make sure we don't overeat single meals, especially combinations of carbohydrates and fats. Make sure we're getting plenty of protein and polyphenols from fruits and vegetables. And then, of course, last, we can begin to really work on some of the things that we know stabilize the electron transport chain in mitochondria. And there's several here, but there's three nutrients that are really well studied. One is acetyl L-carnitine. The other is alpha lipoic acid. And the other is Q10, coenzyme Q10. Acetyl L-carnitine, alpha lipoic acid, and coenzyme Q10 are all doing amazing things to help stabilize the electron transport chain. Now, what is the electron transport chain? This is a chain of chemical reactions inside the mitochondria where essentially uh, these proteins are passing uh, compounds like a hot potato from one protein to the next. And as they do that, they build up a chemical gradient that acts like a battery that ge then generates ATP, the energy that fuels our entire body. Now, Alpha lipoic acid, acetyl L carnitine, and CoQ10 act as antioxidants and help stabilize this electron transport chain to create less reactive oxygen species. And they can act directly here. And these are things that we can take directly to help the mitochondria do their jobs. And so this is the next thing we can begin to do to help our mitochondria. The mitochondria are actually critical, so critical for the functioning of metabolism. And we have to look after mitochondria from this bottom up point of view, because if they become dysfunctional, then what happens is our hormone production comes dysfunctional. Our energy production becomes dysfunctional. And that means the hypothalamus that relies on hormonal signaling and also energy, uh, you know, creating ATP for it to do its job becomes dysfunctional. 
So we can't be just looking at metabolism from this top down approach, brain, hormones, two cells. We also have to be looking at this from the bottom up effect. Organelles, mitochondria, two cells, two tissues, two organ systems, two brain, to body, etc. It's time for one of our sponsors, and this sponsor is a very exciting one and a new one. Timeline Nutrition and their supplement, MitoPure. Now, if I was going to ask you what is the most important aspect of metabolism, the mitochondria would have to be tops on your list. The mitochondria are the little energy producing factories inside every single one of your cells. They take the end products of the food we eat, they break them down into cellular ATP and provide energy for the entire metabolism. And these mitochondria, if they are healthy and acting appropriately, can keep us looking good, feeling good, living longer, and functioning better. However, when they are not at optimal function, when they are burning energy in a dirty fashion, when they are damaged, they actually speed cellular aging. They speed up the aging process. We end up suffering from things like fatigue. We end up having all manner of dysfunctions, including weight loss resistance and other issues around weight loss. The mitochondria are the most important elements for the metabolism to function optimally, lose weight, age appropriately, etc. In this compound, MitoPure, that Timeline Nutrition has developed, there is a product called Urolithin A. Now, Urolithin A is an interesting compound because it is a postbiotic. Now, what does that mean? A postbiotic is a compound that is made from the bacteria in the gut. And so when you eat things like pomegranates, strawberries, walnuts, things with polyphenols like this, they go into the digestive tract, your Gut bacteria start working on them and they can create compounds. Urolithin A is one compound that is in the MitoPure product. It comes from, naturally occurs in nature from this bacteria in our gut that break down the polyphenols from primarily foods like pomegranates, strawberries, etc. And it can increase mitophagy in mitochondria. So you might say, well, Jade, what is mitophagy? Mitophagy is the ability for mitochondria to repair and regenerate and recycle their proteins and to stay healthy and functional and de-age. When we can stimulate mitophagy, we can keep our mitochondria functioning efficiently. We can decrease aging. We can increase energy. We can improve our ability to lose weight, function optimally, and stave off diseases of aging. This is what Timeline Nutrition has done with their MitoPure product and the urolithin A that is in it. This is a very exciting area of research. We have not had the ability to support the mitochondria in the way that we do now with this particular product. You definitely are going to want to check this out. I've been taking the product for several months now. It is one of these products that I really, really strongly recommend. To get the product, MitoPure, all you have to do to, is go to TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. TimelineNutrition.com backslash next level. And let's get back to the show. And now I'm giving you some hints about what you want to be doing to help with mitochondria in this fashion. And of course, this new science is really interesting because the final thing I'll say here is that when we look at bacteria, and how bacteria behave in our guts. And we realize that mitochondria are our ancient ancestors of bacteria. You will see that mitochondria are both able to send signals across the cell. So in other words, mitochondria releases signaling molecules that go in and tell the, the genetic material in the nucleus how to behave, which releases certain transcription factors. It helps the other organelles, it sends signals to the other orga organelles to really help them as well. It also can send perhaps signals around the body, but most importantly, it can receive signals from the body and perhaps outside the body from the bacteria living in our guts. And while we don't have all the information we need yet to understand which bacteria, we do have some hints here. For example, we know that there's two classes of 
uh, bacteria that live in our guts. One is called firmic firmicutes and the other is bacteroides. The way I remember this is when you take obese people with damaged metabolisms, what you'll see is this firmicute, firmicutes, bacteroides uh, ratio is in favor of the firmicutes. And those firmicutes, I remember this because I say, okay, so the firmicutes are essentially the fat producing uh, bacteria. It's not exactly true, but they're associated with dysfunctional uh, metabolism. Whereas the bacteroides, B, I oftentimes think as burning. They are the burning sort of bacteria. It's not really true, but they're associated with a more functional bacteria. And so as we begin to look at this, we see that perhaps the, the bacteroides bacteria may be sending certain signals into the body that are favorable towards uh, mitochondria, whereas the firmicutes are actually sending uh, different compounds that may be dysfunctional towards the mitochondria. Now, this is all speculative at this point, but we do have good information that this is what's going on. And so why would I be telling you this? Well, one, so you can begin to understand all the different aspects here, but the final idea here would be to pay close attention to what is going on with the bacterial populations in the gut. And in general, we know that if you begin to eat high amounts of sugar, fat, that is normally highly associated with, we don't necessarily know if it's causative of, but it is correlated with these firmicutes, these bacteria that may be having a negative impact on metabolism and perhaps that is happening through mitochondria versus when we eat lean proteins and lots of polyphenol based fruits and vegetables, we get more of these bacteroides. And so this is why this may be important because while right now we don't necessarily have all the information we need to have about the microbiome, we do know that microbiome composition is significantly correlated with things like increased frailty in old age, chronic conditions, especially dementia and uh, obesity and metabolism oriented uh, dysfunction. And so what we want to begin to look at is how are these different bacteria influencing perhaps what's going on with the mitochondria? Are they pushing them more towards fission reactions where they get stuck in fission, which can cause dysfunction or more fusion reactions that seem to be more efficient? What compounds are being released? When we study this stuff, can we see that there are postbiotic compounds, compounds that are being made by these bacteria that are favorably or unfavorably impacting the mitochondria? This is why this is important. And so, yes, we are having some good take homes here. And yes, I'm leaving you with some questions, but hopefully now you understand part of what's going on with the mitochondria. So I'm going to wrap up this podcast with just a brief review for those of you to felt like this went over your head completely, but also just to give us a review. The mitochondria are the end units of metabolism. They are little organelles that live in every single cell that are responsible for creating energy. And they do that by taking the end, the breakdown products of digestion of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. This acetyl-CoA molecule that comes from fats and carbs, and then breaks that down, strips off the carbons, shoves it into the TCA or Krebs cycle, then the electron transport chain to make energy. Now that production can be clean burning or dirty burning. It's dirty oftentimes when it is overwhelmed with more food, more carbons, lots of fat and lots of carbohydrates, these big, huge meals that we eat. It's oftentimes more clean burning when we eat smaller amounts and it can handle these carbons going in. And so this is important to understand. It's also important to understand that the mitochondria have many properties and principles that look a lot like their evolutionary cousins the bacteria that live in our gut. In other words, mitochondria can send signals around the cell to the nucleus, to other organelles. It also can receive signals from the cell and from outside the cell, perhaps even from bacteria living in our gut in the case of the postbiotic urolithin A. And it can now communicate very much like it's acting as 
its old bacterial self communicating with other bacteria living in the digestive tract. These mitochondria can be pushed into more fusion or fission based fusion being these mitochondria that are very much like forming a colony together, getting together and saying, hey, let's all join our forces together so we can burn a cleaner energy and be more efficient versus they also can split up in these fission reactions and become more inefficient. And this balance between fusion and fission has an awful lot to do with how we are eating, how much we are eating, and whether or not we are spending equal time with food and without food. We want to make sure that we're having plenty of time in fusion reactions. And when the mitochondria are more fusion-based, we tend to get healthier when they're there. If they get more stuck in a fission-based activity where these mitochondria split up in our cells, this is associated with more dysfunction. We also can begin to look at certain compounds that can be beneficial perhaps for mitochondrial signaling. This may be why polyphenols, bioactives in fruits and vegetables, this may be why these things are important to eat and also why the fiber in these foods are important to eat because they can create postbiotics from the bacteria in our guts and signal the mitochondria into healthier states. We also can begin to use certain compounds that help stabilize mitochondria, things like alpha lipoic acid, things like acetyl L-carnitine, also known as Alcar, and things like coenzyme Q10. One of the things that we need to begin to do is we really want to understand about having a flexible metabolism, we want to be able to make sure that we are taking care of the end unit of metabolism, the mitochondria. And so I'm going to stop there today. I know this was very technical. Many people have been asking for more metabolism oriented stuff. And so I wanted to give you that and give you something that I think is a very interesting way to be looking at this. Remember, it's not just top down metabolism, it's bottom up. You need both. And these mitochondria may be the most important aspects of things. And I'll mention one more thing here that I'll cover in a future episode at some point is what we're now seeing is that mitochondria may actually be having and using quantum effects. For example, we now know and have seen that mitochondria and chloroplast, the mitochondrial cousins in side of plants, may be using quantum physics-based mechanisms, especially quantum tunneling. Now, you might say, well, Jade, what is quantum tunneling? Well, the old way of looking at metabolism is that when you have an enzyme, there's an activation energy that this enzyme must overcome so that it can do its job in the body. And if it doesn't overcome it, it can't do that. And we often have what we call catalysts that help these enzymes overcome these activation energies. And what we might be seeing is that mitochondria can perhaps be using quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is an aspect of quantum physics that says that the probability of a something like an electron being able to jump over an activation field is low, but possible. And that possibly under stressful conditions, this happens more than we might think, which means that the mitochondria are acting via means that are not completely biochemical and may be going into the quantum way of looking at things because quantum tunneling is very different than anything we've seen in terms of the way molecules normally interact. And so this is something to keep our minds on as mitochondria might be the first organelles in humans to actually be shown to be able to use quantum mechanics, quantum effects to do its job. All right, I'm going to stop there. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I hope it wasn't too technical and that you followed along. And I appreciate you hanging out on the podcast and I will see you at the next episode. You have been listening to the Next Level Human podcast with Dr. Jade Tita. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe and consider leaving a review. You make the biggest difference when you pass on your lessons and inspire others. That's why reviews like this are so powerful. Your words may be the only ones that resonate for someone else. Please remember the information in this podcast is for educational purposes only. 
always consult your personal physician or therapist before making any lifestyle changes. And finally, thank you for who you are in the world and the difference you make. You make.